She comes to us from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark um, and is on a, involved in a very big project to document the uh, catalogs that mentioned people such as um, Anna Maria von Skurman. So we'd like, like to let you begin today. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just try to share my screen with you. Uh, so can everyone see my PowerPoint and see this? Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, uh, coming to hear me talk about this uh, very particular topic uh, of the archetype of, archetype of female intellectuality. And uh, for my talk, I will focus on Anna Maria von Schurman in the catalogs of learned women, which is, uh, uh, as uh, you said, the, the kind of the topic of my uh, PhD project, which I'm doing at the University of po Copenhagen. And the project that I'm involved with more um, broadly is the, the project of the archaeology of the female intellectual identity. And uh, in this project, I focus on Germany in the early modern period. And um, for this, I look at these catalogs of learned women uh, that haven't received uh, too much scholarly attention, um, although some, some research has been done in the 80s, but it hasn't uh, been talked about for a while. So I'm hoping to find out new things about these catalogs. Uh, so the agenda for my talk today is uh, the portrayals of Anne Maria von Schurman uh, in the catalogs of learned women. Uh, so I'll be presenting first um, how Anne Maria uh, von Schurman was presented in the early 18th century catalogs. I'll just be presenting two uh, catalogs for because I don't have that much time today. Uh, there are quite many, as you would see in the next um, couple of um, slides. And then I'll go on to uh, contrast that with uh, her portrayals in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century catalogs. Uh, so to, to kind of compare uh, how these early and late depictions um, uh, are different and, and kind of uh, pull out some, uh, some um, changes that happened from the early uh, 18th century to the uh, late 18th century. And I'll bring some conclusions at the end. So this is the agenda and I hope I'll get through the whole thing in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So first, for those who don't really know Andrea von Schurman, and she was the first woman to study at the Dutch university, at a Dutch university, uh, which is the University of Utrecht. And in her time, she was a very famous and very well-known uh, learned woman who was highly praised by uh, contemporary um, uh, scholars. Um, but in the second half of her life, she made some radical changes um, in her personal life, which also can, um, uh, could be seen in her writings, which is she broke with the Reformed Church in 1669. Uh, and um, joined this uh, um, a French uh, former priest called Jean de Labadie and became a leading figure in the Labadie community. Um, and here's a list of her most important publications. The most well-known is probably the dissertation in which she um, argues that studying is uh, fitting for, for um, Christian women. <coughs> uh, sorry, may I ask you to maybe mute um, the, um, the primary, uh, what is the, Sorry. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, yeah, so these, this is just a list of um, uh, her most important writings. Um, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about how this um, break with the church and how her um, involvement in this uh, Labadis community was uh, portrayed in the catalogs and how that influenced her uh, reception. Um, this is just uh, kind of an, an overview. Uh, so this is of the German catalogs. So there are catalogs from uh, several countries, but it was a genre that was very, um, very um, popular in Germany. And uh, therefore there's a lot of catalogs, uh, which I'm looking at in my project. The ones that are in bold are the ones that mention Anne-Marie von Schurman. So as you can see, she's mentioned in quite a lot of them. And often she's really portrayed as this archetype of a female intellectuality. She's highly praised. She's seen as kind of the the epitome of, um, of learned women, uh, which is also why I'm focusing on her in uh, top. Um, so she's men mentioned in, I think, more than half of the catalogs, and some of them are too early for her to, to have uh, made any influence, so they should probably really be counted. Um, yes. So um, two 
illustrate the, the way she's portrayed in the first, um, in the early 18th century catalogs, I am going to be talking about two, and this is Eberti, uh, a catalog from 1706, and Huber, La Huber, who uh, wrote a catalog in 1717. And I've called this part of my talk uh, in praise of female learnedness, learnedness, which will be uh, clear in a moment uh, why. Uh, so for the first catalog, which is by uh, Johann Caspar Eberti, um, he, she's, um, she's described uh, in this way. So she is decorated with so much learnedness, lofty sciences and arts that one has either never in the history of the world or maybe in a thousand years come across such, such an excellent exemplar within the female sex. So this is really just to show how, um, how exemplary she was seen uh, to be uh, in, in, uh, in this time, that she was really seen as the, the best, um, best learned woman out there. Um, so the things that he uh, focuses on in his catalogs is that, first of all, that she attended the University of Utrecht, which I already mentioned, uh, this is mentioned, and that she understood and spoke uh, 14 languages, and they're all mentioned, and this is, of course, also very impressive, <laughs> so it makes sense to mention this, uh, that she was praised by learned men, and here he mentions Boetius, Gazendi, Somes, uh, and other learned men who all um, thought, respected her and praised her and eulogized her. Um, also that she was a great poet in many languages and that she was artistic, not only as a poet, but also in drawing and painting and that she drew Christina of Sweden, which is a story that's often repeated in these catalogs. Um, and then there's, uh, when it comes to the Labadist uh, community, um, it only mentions that she would have been remembered as this embodiment of female learning had she not been so eager to be pious uh, that she joined this Labadist sect. So it's kind of thought that she was just so eager to be a pious woman um, that she went out of her way and, and then um, eventually became kind of a heretic. But this is um, seen mostly as something that she like strove to be the most pious. Um, and then there's mentioning of some of her writings. Uh, there's the Euclidia poems and the Dissertation and the Puscula. Um, so they mention very broadly um, what she, the, the books that she's authored. Um, yes, so another uh, example of uh, an early 18th century uh, catalogue is Ivo Huber's um, catalogue, where he writes that as her fame grew and her splendid mind drew more and more attention, she came to be held in high esteem by everyone due to her remarkable ingenium, and rightly so, and was considered to be a miracle and a wonder of the female sex. Is even a monstrum nature understood in a good way. Um, so here we see again how she's really highlighted as this spectacular woman. Uh, it also mentions this remarkable ingenium, kind of, um, which is also something that's uh, not always attributed to women, but sometimes, and this is more uh, uh, common in the early 18th uh, um, century catalogs, women are attributed with this kind of ingenium, a genius uh, for, for studying. And this is something that they, oh, sorry, um, uh, say that Anne-Marie von Schumann possessed. So if we look at what kind of um, focuses are in this entry uh, by Huber, uh, we see, first of all, that he, she, uh, he calls her the German Minerva, so really focuses on her uh, position as a, kind of a goddess of learning, um, that she's proficient in the sciences, languages, and arts, so that she has a very broad humanistic uh, education, um, but that she's particularly interested in philosophy and theology, which are um, also seen as some kind of very male-dominated fields. And um, therefore, it's kind of interesting that they point out that she was very uh, proficient in this, um, that she knew many languages. And here he mentions 13, so not all 14 languages, but still quite a lot uh, of languages, that she disputed with learned men of Europe in letters and in person. So again, there's this contact with the academic world. And also that she was an, art, an artist. This is something that's mentioned as her just kind of saying that she was very talented in a wide, uh, wide uh, range of fields. Um, so if we look at what kind of summarizes uh, all these early entries, uh, is that she's above all men, uh, praised for her learnedness, that she was very uh, well-schooled, she was very well-educated, she was kind of a prodigy from an early age. Uh, there's a focus on languages, philosophy, theology, and arts. She's described as being productive, someone who produces poems, books, and artworks. 
uh, so an active um, uh, person. And she's often compared to learned men to say that she equals them or that she could at least compete with them in some uh, way. And um, when it comes to the Labadis community, there's little or no mentioning of this community. And when it is, it is kind of explained away and seen as a part of her life that you shouldn't really focus on. It's more important uh, to focus on the time where she was like this big um, European phenomenon. So if we compare this to the, the um, what happens in the later half of the 18th century and the start of the 19th century in the catalogs, um, this part of my talk I've called the glorification of feminine virtue, which is also which also become apparent in a couple of minutes. Why this, that would be the title? So here I will look at two catalogs. The first one is Heinzmann's catalog from 1790, and the other one is Wolpius' catalog from 1809. So for the first one, Johann Georg Heinzmann's catalog, um, he writes that a learned uh, culture said, said she was a learned woman, but more importantly, a noble, pure and authentic soul who throughout her entire inner life was one of the most virtuous, complete and extraordinary persons that her sex has ever produced at any time. So again, she's seen as this exemplary person who's um, raised above all other women. Um, but the, as you can see, the, the focus has rather changed. Um, so she is learned, but she's also, more importantly, a noble, pure and authentic soul. Uh, so if we look at the, the themes that come up in this entry, uh, it is again this, that she's learned, but she's first and foremost virtuous. She's very modest and pious. This is mentioned several times. She wanted nothing to do with the learned world. So she's not seen as uh, someone who's within the learned world, but someone who stands in contrast to it. Um, she's uh, ex kind of described as a good Christian throughout her life. So we see no criticism of de uh, uh, which is um, uh, pictured in this uh, quote, uh, where he writes that this amiable maiden who remained thus throughout her life also possessed a special talent for crafts and arts. So she remained uh, amiable throughout her life. There's no reason to um, criticize her in any way. And then he also mentions this talent for crafts and arts, which is something that's focused very heavily on in the late um, uh, catalogs, namely that she was a great artist. This is how she's uh, primarily portrayed. And then there's a lot of compliments to her authenticity and her deep emotions. So, uh, yeah, and, and uh, um, lastly, it refers exclusively to the Alteria, which is her autobiography, um, which she wrote uh, after she left the learned world and joined the Labadis community. Um, so what is missing in these uh, catalogs is, of course, her knowledge of philosophy and theology, which we saw in the earlier ones. Her time at the university is not mentioned at all. There's um, no reference to earlier writings, such as, such as the dissertatio, which means that there's also no mentioning of her appeal for women's education. And uh, there's also no mentioning of her correspondences with learned men. So she's seen very much as detached from this learned world. Uh, another example of this is uh, Christian August Wulpius' uh, Pantheon. Um, and here I won't be giving a quote, I'll just mention the most important themes. Um, and uh, these themes are that she was very artistic. So she's again seen foremost as an, as an artist. Uh, drawing, singing, and paper cutting are the, the skills that are mentioned. Uh, it's also mentioned that she was a good housekeeper after her mother died. And, uh, and he hints that this is something that her learn the learned uh, women of her, um, especially of our time, could learn from. So she's seen as kind of someone who could uh, be learned, but also uh, keep a good house. And this is something that she's very much um, uh, praised for. Uh, then there's a mentioning of uh, languages, philosophy, astronomy, and uh, geography. But this is only one sentence. And I should mention that this entry is one of the longest we have. So it's about nine or 10 pages. So only one sentence mentioning her, these uh, scholarly um, um, skills. Uh, then there's a mention uh, that she refused uh, Jacob Katz's proposal. So there's also this need to kind of mention her romantic life uh, and the fact that she was never um, married and that she, she was attractive to men or men uh, proposed to her, but she said no. Um, then there's kind of this picture that she was not really, she didn't really want to be a part of the learned world, but she was forced into the learned world because she was so talented and these learned men saw that she was talented and wanted to kind of um, introduce her to this world, but this was against her will, and this is the picture that's drawn in, in this entire um, uh, entry. 
Um, but then eventually she gave up her studies to devote herself for, uh, to God, which is also um, something that she's praised for. It quotes Eucleria at length and applauds her purity, innocence, truth, simplicity, love, and modesty. So these are all the virtues that she's, um, she's complimented for. And it, it also um, draws mostly on Eucleria. Um, when it comes to the question of the Labadist community, um, that's a, he that tells this story that Labadis made her his student. So she becomes a very passive person in her own story. So it's not that she chose to join the Labadis community. So convincing when he came to her um, town that, that she uh, kind of was ensnared by him. Um, and then there's still some kind of defend. Uh, he also kind of defends her choice to join she, um, the Labadis by saying that um, even though it might have been um, um, uh, just a dream, so what he writes um, uh, precisely is assumed it was only dream she had of this. Uh, sorry, uh, of this community. How could the dreams of such an old maiden be more innocent? So uh, saying that she wasn't really, um, it wasn't really a problem that she joined this uh, community because you really just dream for a Christian, uh, a better Christian church. And you, who could really blame her? She didn't really have any reason not to. So if we summary, uh, do a summary of the later entries, uh, what she's above all praised for is her virtue, her feelings, her and her piety. There's a focus on artistic ability rather than learning. There's a more positive attitude towards the Labadis community. And there's a focus on feminine aspects, such as houseworks, proposals, and modesty. Uh, but there's no mentioning of her time in uh, uh, at the university, there's no mentioning of her correspondences with learned men and women, and or her appeal for um, women's education. Um, so, if we want to do a, a comparison between the early and the late 18th century catalogues, we see in the early. Oh, I forgot to remove the name here, but it also goes for Hoyman, which is another catalog that I didn't have time to mention. Um, so in the early catalogs, uh, she's mostly just um, um, attributed this exceptional learnedness. It's, she's praised for, for being very clever, very intuitively um, learning a lot of languages and, and, and philosophy. And in Heinzmann and Vulpius uh, uh, catalogs, it's mostly the feminine virtues that she's complimented for. Um, in the early, there's a focus on languages, philosophy, theology, and art. And in the late, she's uh, portrayed rather as an uh, artist uh, than a scholar. Uh, in the early one, she's uh, portrayed as being part of the learned world, whereas in the late uh, uh, catalog, she's in conflict with the academic world and outside of it. Um, and in the early um, catalog, she's seen as active and productive, someone who, who writes and um, produces poems and, and art, uh, artworks. And in a way, she's portrayed more as passive and responsive in the later uh, catalogs, apart from her artistic work, which is um, it's, uh, very much um, uh, praised. Uh, and then uh, there's no uh, little mentioning of the Labadis community, or it's kind of ignored in the early catalogs, whereas it's, uh, there's a positive spin on the Labadis um, in the later um, catalogs. So I would like that you could see the this change um, in in these portrayals or these um, this change in perspective as an ex kind of expression of an enlightenment discourse versus a romanticist discourse uh, which we see in the later uh, catalogs um, that's also I would kind of um, um, uh, support this by saying there's a focus on reason in the early uh, catalogs as opposed to a focus on emotion in the later ones uh, this also seen. This reason is also seen as something that's universal, which means that women and men possess reason in not equal measure, but um, but possess reason nonetheless. Everyone possesses reason; all uh, people do. Whereas uh, there's more focus on complementary virtues in the later catalogs. So men have some virtues and women have some other virtues, and these are um, both kinds of virtues are good, but they're complementary; they're not the same. Um, so again, there's more of a kind of a turn towards equality, although equality is not completely um, secure uh, in the earlier uh, catalogs. And I would say that's a, if we kind of put it into more uh, contemporary terms, there's a focus on difference uh, between the sexes in the later catalogs. 
they, they are the same. Uh, good, so I've reached my uh, conclusions. So uh, Anna-Maria von Schormer was portrayed as the epitome of female erudition throughout the 18th and 19th century. So this is something that they all agree on, that she was really uh, the number one, or that she was at least um, among the best uh, learned women of her time. Uh, but in the early catalogues of learned women, um, they emphasize her intelligence, whereas the later catalogues focus on virtue, piety, and femininity. And uh, I would argue that the two halves of the century could be seen as representing respectively an enlightenment and a romanticist worldview and a female ideal. Um, and I think that's also my time. And uh, so thank you for listening and uh, um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much.